Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. As Labor Day passes, so too does the end of summer. And we speak with Dwayne Parrish, the State Director of Parks, Recreation and Tourism, about how the year fared. Also, we catch up with Elise Bidwell. She's a financial advisor. And we discuss what's going on in the stock market and how you should be investing your money. Now for the latest from this week. Summer has come to an end, and with it, one of the worst tourism seasons the state has ever seen. The ripple effects from the pandemic reverberated from hotels to restaurants, attractions, and more as the state tried to salvage the critical summer tourism season that helps keep businesses afloat year-round. Tourism unemployment was even worse than the Great Recession, and is still yet to come back, and likely won't until a vaccine is discovered. Meanwhile, all schools in the state are now back in session. Only a dozen are giving the option of face-to-face -face instruction five days a week, with others going all online or a hybrid of both. Many challenges from last school year still face families and educators, including internet connectivity. Though mobile hotspots have been delivered to thousands of families and lawmakers are working to fund further advancements, a newly announced investment in data casting will soon connect thousands of remote students to their teachers. This partnership between ETV and the Department of Education through data casting will allow ETV to transmit files, videos, and other computer data to computers through the broadcast si signal, an inexpensive tuner, and a little TV antenna. This will provide students and educators who do not have broadband internet access with the same instructional content and educational resources that would normally require an internet connection. Sadly, Demetria Bannister, a 28-year-old Richland II teacher, died from COVID-19 this week after testing positive just days ago. She is the first teacher to die from the virus and is one of more than 2,800 South Carolinians to succumb to it this year. And President Donald Trump flipped on his offshore drilling stance this week and signed an executive order issuing a 10-year moratorium on drilling off the coasts of Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. The moratorium gives strong cover to Republicans Senator Lindsey Graham and State Representative Nancy Mays on what is a political third rail in the state, something they have both been dinged on for previous stances. As well as South Carolina, Senator Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott. Lindsey, thank you. Lindsey liked the idea right from the beginning. I said, what do you think? It took you how long? About two seconds to say, I like it. Mace prefers state, not federal, control to protect offshore waters, and Graham supported Trump's 2017 plan to open up coastal waters to drilling. The moratorium comes weeks after the Trump administration finalized plans to open the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve to oil and gas exploration. Joining me to discuss how the summer tourism season fared is Dwayne Paris. Paris, he's director of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism in South Carolina. Dwayne, welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So that being said, Dwayne, um, we just wrapped up the summer tourism season. It was a pretty rough year, pretty rough summer. Can you kind of tell us how we fared, what things are looking like right now? Yeah, you know, things bottomed out really in mid-April. That's when we hit our lowest point. Hotels were below 20% occupancy. We had a number of hotels closed at one time, reached about 40% of our hotels statewide closed. Things picked back up after that, uh, kind of with Memorial Day. We got up to about 58% occupancy, uh, and then we had a rise in cases and some spiking cases, and the publicity around that <clears throat> brought us back down to below 50%. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where we are now in that regard. We're at uh, 50 or slightly above. Of course, the problem is hotels still lose money at 50%. And as hotels go, so goes attractions, so go retail, so goes restaurants, so goes so. Until we get more heads in the beds, it's just a, it's a real difficult time right now. Mm -hmm. So where does that kind of put us out for the year and in, in projecting out? And, you know, obviously the summer has just been such a big, big time for everyone. Sure. Well, yeah, the bad news is this, this, this virus hit just as we were coming into the spring and summer, our busiest time, and has lingered on throughout. And so we're a $24.5 billion industry. We're going to have about a 45 to 50 percent loss of that. About $1.8 billion in state and local taxes. We'll lose about 50% of that, too. Um, you know, part of it is just, you know, our empl unemployment is still sta um, staggeringly, lo staggeringly low compared to other industries in the state. We're four times the unemployment of any other industry in the state. So until we get more people traveling and more people in our state, um, you know, that, that's just going to be the case. I will say Labor Day weekend, I've early reports, was very good. Mm -hmm. Um 
consumer confidence is growing. Uh, our, we measure intent to travel, and the percentage of people willing to travel this fall is greater than it has been at any point in time so far. So even though only about 65% of the people are willing to travel right now, I see that number increasing throughout the fall. Um, obviously, case numbers have gone down, and I think that bodes well, and I'm feeling better about the fall than I did two months ago. Mm -hmm. And when we look at, um, Dwayne, when we talk about how the summer is just a really big time for hotels and restaurants to really make a lot of money for the remainder of the year when they're typically breaking even, are you worried about any you know, potential permanent damage as a result of this lackluster summer? Maybe is that, is that uh, you know, a hotel closing? Is that restaurants closing permanently? Or what, what are you hearing? What are you seeing right now, maybe on the grand strand, if we're trying to focus on one area? Sure. Yeah, restaurants have been hit the hardest. Um, at the end of this, and I, you know, post-vaccine, you'll look back in a year later, 25% of the restaurants that you were open before will, will, will be closed either permanently or repurposed as some other restaurant or repurposed as some other entity, whatever that may be. Most, hotel, most um, restaurants will lease space. Hotels are a permanent asset. Um, there will be some bankruptcy fees filed. You may not see it as a guest because the lender will protect the asset and keep it open, but that's probably the long-term lingering effects, if you will, is just a lot of bankruptcies, you know, getting the industry back on our feet, much like we went through after 9-11, um, a little bit like we went through during the 2008-9 recession, if you will. Some of those same um, bankruptcy filings will take place in closures. We'll come back in this. Uh, the good news is there's some pent-up demand. People are tired of being and sitting at home, and mm -hmm. so when they think it's okay, uh, and we probably think for a large portion of people that's post-vaccine, they'll go out. We'll the demand is there. It's just not there yet. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we talk about, you know, you mentioned the unemployment rate being so substantially uh, higher for these folks that are in the hospitality tourism industry. I think you had a presentation recently where it was between February and July alone, we saw, what, a 24% drop in um, employment for these folks. Uh, right. Talk about that kind of permanent damage. Are you worried about that? I mean, I know we're talking about, you know, things possibly coming back post-vaccine, uh, but what's it look like in the short term, the near term, uh, in, in these these tough industries right now? There will be some, you know, attractions, hotels that figured out how to do things that they uh, prior may have had two people do and now have one or management is involved. Um, the other portion of that is that if you think about hotels, um, daily room, room service now in regard to cleaning your room is just not taking place like it was, and people don't want uh, particularly during this time, don't want more people in the room. I think that's a lingering effect. There won't be daily ha daily housekeeping requests, and a hotel room will be requested instead of expected as we go forward, mm -hmm. which will in turn impact employment. Yeah, because there's such a tri trickle down effect. Can you talk about that trickle down effect when we talk about maybe losing one hospitality job or one hotel? I mean, just how these things could just you know snowball and how they probably already have. Yeah, they have. I mean, we you know we've lost uh, we've lost a lot of things that we we had you know, that we had going into this in regard to hotels. The one sector that has done well during this time is short-term rentals. People are looking for more square footage. They're looking for a, a kitchen, the ability to stay there if they want to when they travel somewhere. Um, and just more space in general, not hotel lobbies and crowds of people, not hotel bars or restaurants, not passing people in the hall. All of those things bode well for short-term rentals. And they fared well during this, and, and they will fare well as, as post-pandemic as well. Mm -hmm. So how long do you think it would take maybe for, uh, for the employment to kind of come back to where it was before? Any idea? Um, assuming there's a vaccine at the end of this year or early 2021, I think by the summer of next year, we'll, uh, of 2021, we should be close to normal levels, but not quite back where we were um, prior to this. So we've still had travel, Dwayne. You know, we still, you said you had some decent, somewhat, I mean, obviously very low occupancy in the hotels, but uh, you were talking about short-term rentals, Airbnbs and such. Uh, can you kind of maybe gonna, uh, give us an idea about what the, the typical traveler looks like right now, where they're coming from, where they're going, where they're staying? What do you guys do so far looking at trends and data? Sure. Yeah, the typical traveler is younger now. Um, People who are older or maybe susceptible or in a high-risk category for the virus typically aren't traveling, so therefore, by default, the traveler is younger today. And people are taking shorter trips, both in duration and in distance. Um, people are not flying uh, dramatically. You know, airlines were down 95% at one time. They're still down around 60%. Mm -hmm. So people are driving to destinations. So it's shorter trips and then familiarity. Do they, have they been there before? Are they comfortable going there? 
Um, that's the biggest trends we see in that, and our marketing reflects that. We're marketing in a 350-mile radius around Columbia to attract people to South Carolina that are kind of within that six- to seven-hour drive time frame. And what are some of the bright spots we're seeing? I mean, I know I've been talking a lot about the negatives we've been seeing, but what do you guys, uh, is there anything you can point to uh, when we're looking at successes so far in tourism? Um, there is. You know, the two big ones I mentioned, short-term rentals. The other is golf. Golf mm -hmm. was up 15% in June, 14% in July. I expect that to continue through the rest of the summer and fall. Golf offers outdoor activity, the ability to distance, uh, the, I mean, the ability to be uh, outside. I think the, that bodes well for golf, and it has, it has done well. Local play, and while the visitor play is not as high as it, because there just aren't as many visitors, local play has made up for a lot of that. And so I think golf, you know, was a little bit of a lagging um, indicator, you know, through our recent uh, seven-year run of, of record numbers. It has done well during this time, and that's primarily, I think, because of the outdoor component. But short-term rentals in golf are two bright spots in the industry that have done well. Yeah, I can definitely second to your opinion on that golf situation. I've been golfing a lot more this year, too. And I think yeah. I heard you recently talk about uh, state parks are just doing tremendous amounts of, of work right now, too. I mean, what's that like? And, and I guess that goes along with what we're talking about, outdoor activities. Sure. Yeah, state parks, same thing. We've had record summer for camping and cabin rental. Um, we've had some parks that have literally doubled the amount of camping and cabin rental throughout, and even some lesser-known state parks. But state parks, have, when we reopened May 1st, we had a record May, um, and then June followed that with another record month, and so as did July. And so state parks have just, you know, RV sales are up 20% nationally, and that's reflected. I think people want to be outside, outdoors, control their space, if you will. And I think camping and cabins offer that ability to do that. Um, cabins are a little bit like a short-term rental in some respects. And so, uh, you know, I, I expect state parks to continue that throughout the fall and even into the spring next year. Mm -hmm. Kind of a silver lining there, people kind of rediscovering what's already in their own backyard. Uh, but, Dwayne, yeah. we, we have a few minutes left. I want to ask you about what, we, what you're expecting, what you're hearing from state lawmakers as we go into that two-week session next week. Uh, we're going to see some budget movements here uh, since we've been on a continuing resolution. Uh, what are you asking for? What are you hearing? What do you need for the, for the state parks and recreation and tourism? You know, obviously trying to keep that industry vibrant even as we sure. hope to emerge from it next year, this well, pandemic. No Sure. Nothing will bring down the unemployment number faster than getting heads in beds. As I mentioned earlier, as hotels go, so go everything else around the leisure and hospitality sector. Um, so I've asked them for additional marketing funds um, for statewide, as well as our five largest destinations, which are Myrtle Beach, Charleston, Hilton Head, Columbia, and Greenville. So that's how we generate um, more business to get, head, to get heads in the beds and get more people employed. And the way we do that, as I mentioned earlier, the percentage of people I believe through the fall will that are willing to travel is going to increase. Mm -hmm. But it's also our, 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 our obligation to try to get more than our fair share. And to be blunt, we want to get more visitors and more than our fair share of North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, et cetera. We want to try to do that. And that's how we do that through marketing and advertising. And, you know, we, we had great inspirational stuff early on, and now we have a call to action. It's in, when you're ready, we're ready. And that's our tagline to try to get people back. As people feel uh, more comfortable and safe about traveling, we want to let them know we're, up, we're open and ready for business. And that's what um, I've, I've told the legislature and asked them to provide some of that money. Um, that it, I think it's a time we can get, we can bring unemployment down faster in our industry and therefore statewide, um, more so than doing more so, getting heads in beds more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you mentioned the top five markets. And, and we also want to make sure that I'm guessing that the smaller markets too, you know, your Camdens, your, your Spartanburgs, your yes. Florences are also still getting attention. Is that something that you guys are focused on as well? Yeah, maybe even more so. Um, we have an undiscovered, we call undiscovered South Carolina, which are some of those locations, and they're very attractive right now. I mean, there's a there's a need to be away from crowds in some respects, and so smaller destinations are very attractive at this time. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne, with, with less than a minute left, what do you what are your thoughts? Kind of just give us like an overview about you know maybe some of your concerns right now. What could affect things going forward, and and what are your thoughts on uh, looking out in the next six twelve months? You know, I, I think going the near term is, you know, national politics are at play, obviously, uh, in regard to virus, the vaccine, um, quarantines, those kinds of things, all of which affect travel, um, uncertainty about the economy. Um, so national implications play a big part in our industry, whether people feel safe, whether they feel comfortable, whether they think they'll have the money to travel. The good news is the economy are in and of itself, while not in a great position, Family still have money and will still travel. It's still an integral part of the trip. 
I mean, they're integral part of mental health, if you will, taking a trip somewhere. It just may be shorter in duration and not as long as before. And so, you know, we're trying to capture all that as we can go. But, it, it, you know, it's just, it's, it, it's a strange time. It's like trying to fly the plane and build it at the same time is what yep. it feels like, like no other time. Definitely, definitely well said there. Uh, that's Dwayne Parrish. He's the director of State Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. Dwayne, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Gavin. I appreciate it. Now we take a current look at the stock market and how you should be investing with financial advisor Elise Bidwell. Elise, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me, Gavin. Well, so at least the last time we spoke was April, and that was just right after March, which is when everything just kind of went off the rails in the stock market. We've been seeing some strong recovery going mm -hmm. on right now. Just want to get your thoughts about how things are looking right now and, and, and what's it like out there in the market. Yeah, so Gavin, I think I, I looked at when I was on the program last, it was April 10th, mm -hmm. and boy, things are very different now. I think in, it's important for us to look at where we were to really understand where we are now. So going back to April 10th, we were, we were going into shutting the economy or just shut the economy down. It was one of the strongest economies we had had on record with unemployment at a 50-year low at 3.5%. And the market went from an all-time high in February, within 23 days was down 20%, which is the fastest bear market on record, and bottomed on March the 23rd. Mm -hmm. So this, the mid part of the year had been a very different story. We see the S&P 500 index up almost at six, almost 60% to a new high on September 2nd. And then the NASDAQ, all those technology stocks are up about 75%. Mm -hmm. So year to date, and here's a year to date update, which is a little bit different than what we saw in the first half or the second half. Yeah. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is slightly negative. The S&P 500 index is up about four or 5%, depending on the day that you look at it over the past week. The NASDAQ is up over 20%. Again, pointing to what we're doing differently now, which is using technology more than we ever have. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where we go uh, by the end of the year. We're certainly seeing some volatility right now, especially in technology stocks. And that's providing some opportunity for investors, too. Yeah, I mean, they've definitely been roaring. I mean, especially when we look at Apple and uh, Tesla. I mean, we saw Apple do their stock split, too. So a lot of people got mm -hmm. to get back in on that, I'm sure. I know mm -hmm. a few people that did. Um, so what's the best way for, for people to capitalize on this? Um, you know, what, what people, maybe people are in their 401K still. Uh, should, they be, should they be juggling what they have in their portfolio? Uh, what about folks who maybe, um, you know, want to invest on their own, haven't gotten the market at all? What's your advice for people right now of, of all investor classes? So it always depends on their tolerance for market volatility and what the time horizon is for that money that they're investing. So a shorter time horizon, there's probably not much opportunity right now. A low risk tolerance and a shorter time horizon, you're looking at CDs that were paying three, two and three percent last year and they're paying 0.2 to 0.3 percent now. So there's not a ton of opportunity without looking at some of the pockets in the market where there is opportunity. And I always say it's good to know what your asset allocation or your mix of investments should be, whether it's within your 401k or outside of a 401k in a brokerage account or in a Roth IRA before the opportunity arrives. And so last week, we were certainly looking at specifically some technology stocks that were trading lower than they should have been in that dip that we saw last week. And we'll see what happens today. It looks like futures are down, so we may have another opportunity today. Mm -hmm. So do you think, um, <laughs> we're talking about diversification really quickly, we're talking about technology stocks. It seems like a hot hot thing to be in, but uh, do you think people maybe focus just too much on one stock and need to realize that they need to diversify and make sure that they're not just you know getting this downturn, this little dip right now when we're looking at places like Apple and, and Tesla, stocks like those? Absolutely. We have some portfolios in our with my clients that are out of whack right now, not just because they had really great growth in stocks, which we've been rebalancing towards some fixed income defensive investments over the last couple of months, but because they've seen fantastic growth in companies like Google, Google Apple, Facebook, Amazon. So when we look at these companies, the top five companies of the, of the S&P 500 index, so that's the, the S&P 500 index, that's 500 companies across um, the country, large cap companies. The top five companies, which are Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, 
and I'm missing one, it'll probably come to me in a minute. Yeah. Those top five companies are 24% of the market capitalization of the S&P 500 index. Mm -hmm. They were 18%, the top five were 18% prior to COVID. And so there's definitely some frothy parts in the market and, and we, sh we recommend not having any more than 5% of your net worth in any one company. And, you know, we have clients that have more than that and we're looking for opportunities to trim those gains off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, you talk about those FANG stocks. I think I just looked up at Netflix, maybe what we were, we were missing right there with other technology stocks. <laughs> Netflix was, and yeah. I don't know, Microsoft actually. Okay. It's Microsoft now that, that, that replaced Netflix. Yep. So, so there are still plenty of opportunities out there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about stocks like Boeing. We're talking about some big blue chip stocks out there that have really had a hard, hard go of it. You know, when we look at Boeing, for example, we're talking about not only the 737 MAX problems, but we're talking about, you know, worldwide demand for air travel just being decimated, which has had ripple effects for their, you know, their workforce mm -hmm. and for their outlook. So uh, is it a valuable time to maybe look at stocks like those who maybe have some, still some strong fundamentals, but have a lot of outward, you know, pressures facing them for people to jump in on them or what are your what's your advice for some of these value investors out there right now absolutely growth has outperformed value for a long time now and so there are good value stocks right now that we need to be looking at uh, and i can't name specific stocks without yeah. talking to someone individually sure. but, but i think that looking at what the opinions are i know the edward jones opinion is public i look at what the uh, Mike, what the uh, Morningstar opinion is on individual stocks, looking at what those analyst opinions on the, on those stocks and buying them where there's a good dividend, uh, the best time to buy a stock is low and sell high. And frequently for these value stocks, these large cap value stocks, they're paying a pretty good dividend and it's even better when you buy those shares at a lower cost per share. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely opportunities. There are values still in the stock market. And at least, you know, we, we kind of talked about this a little while ago, uh, but how are you advising clients right now? When we look at, you know, we have the election looming in November. We have, you know, political uncertainty mm -hmm. that comes with that. We already have uncertainty in a lot of aspects. Uh, you know, with with COVID-19 and the spending that the government's been doing, obviously we have a lot of debt right now. Uh, that means there could be, you know, future tax increases depending on how things go politically. How are you advising people to to hedge for the future uh, looking forward down the road? Should, should taxes start to increase to kind of pay back some of this debt we're incurring? Well, that's a great question. There's a lot to break down there. The, the debt, we'll, we'll cover that first, specifically with the debt. You know, I hear people talk frequently about diversification of their portfolio among stocks and among, among asset classes, bonds, et cetera. But I don't frequently hear people talk about tax diversification. And that's something that we have been talking about with our clients uh, increasingly over the past couple of years because we do believe that tax rates are going to go up. They're not going to stay low where they, they're, they're, historically, they're pretty low right now. So we know with all of this debt, tax rates are going to go up. A Roth IRA, a Roth 401k are super important for people to be thinking about right now. If they're not making contributions uh, to a Roth 401k or Roth IRA, I'd recommend that they get with a financial advisor, make sure they're within the income limits for the IRA and make those contributions because that money will come out tax-free in retirement. And Gavin, do I have time to speak to the political environment a little sure, bit? Sure, sure. We have about yeah, five so, minutes, yeah. So I think it's interesting. I, I, Edward Jones has a strategy report out that I'd be happy to get to any of your viewers. They can just email me at elise.bidwell at edwardjones.com. Happy to get that out. But that strategy report has to do with <clears throat> what, what different scenarios of a president being a Republican or a Democrat and Congress being Republican or Democrat. Going back to 1900. Mm. But looking at all of those different scenarios cumulatively, cumulatively, there's never been a scenario that wasn't positive on the Dow, and the Dow has averaged 8% since then. And in fact, going back to more recent elections, President Obama in 2008, the market was down about 5%, but then ended up being up for the four years that he was president, the first term. Second term, down initially after the election, up sub substantially in four years, and the same happened with President Trump. So I, and I encourage people to make sure their asset allocation is right going into the election and to hold on just like we did back in March and look for pockets of opportunities where there are opportunities if we do see volatility gotcha. in election season. Yeah, that's exactly right. I remember we talked about that, you know, when 
we were talking about March when it was just a roller coaster and advising people to hold on there too. So again, you definitely hold your stocks. Don't make any wild jumps there just because of market volatility. Uh, about two minutes left, Elise. I want to talk about uh, retirees. Obviously, South Carolina is home to a lot of retirees, my parents included. What are you advising them right now, or maybe potential retirees, I should say, as well, uh, when they're looking at the markets, when they're thinking about retirement, or while they're uh, you know, just looking at their portfolio right now as they are retired? Any advice you have for them? Absolutely. Again, we go back to their tolerance for market volatility and looking at their goal and their time horizon, which for many retirees is 30 years in retirement. But in addition to that, we want to make sure that we have some good dividend paying stock or stock mutual fund investments as a part of the portfolio. Because like I said earlier, CD rates are 0.3 to 0.4%. Mm -hmm. uh, bond rates, I mean, I'm lucky to get a bond paying 2% right now. And those are all beautiful things to have a part of the portfolio for defensive reasons and for steady dependable income. But we've got to look at inflation We've got to look at um, uh, dividend interest uh, coming off of those stocks. And then in some cases, you can get a 5 or 6% dividend rate right now on a good stock. So very, uh, very encouraging news there, too. I'm guessing bullish overall for the year as well, right? <laughs> Thinking overall. I think we're going to see, and I said it, but I'm always cautious, but I'm hearing most analysts think we're going to see some volatility. We could see. I'm hearing down 10 to 15 percent. That's not from, I will say that's not from Edward Jones. That's just listening to other economists. So I think we're going to see some volatility. Gotcha. So keep an eye on your portfolios out there. Yep. Well, very Absolutely. good, Elise. Thank you very much. That's Elise Bidwell, financial advisor with Edward Jones. Thanks, Gavin. To keep you updated throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast I host twice a week, and you can find it wherever you find podcasts in SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.